Professor McGonagall, can you give me two words, one word for gold and one word for something else that isn't money, in a language that I wouldn't know? Ahava and Zahav. That's Hebrew, and the other word means love. Thank you, Professor. Bag of Ahava. Empty. Bag of Zahav. And it popped into his hand. Harry thought over his collected experimental data. It was only the most crude and preliminary sort of effort, but it was enough to support at least one conclusion. Ah, this doesn't make any sense! How can it know that bag of 115 galleons is okay, but not bag of 90 plus 25 galleons? It can count, but it can't add? It can understand nouns, but not noun phrases that mean the same thing? The rules seem sorta consistent, but they don't mean anything. I'm not even going to ask how a pouch ends up with voice recognition and natural language understanding when the best artificial intelligence programmers can't get the fastest supercomputers to do it after 35 years of hard work. Magic. With respect, Professor McGonagall, I'm not quite sure you understand what I'm trying to do here. With respect, Mr. Potter, I'm quite sure I don't. Unless, this is just a guess, mind, you're trying to take over the world? No. I mean, yes. Well, no! I think I should perhaps be alarmed that you have trouble answering the question. Professor McGonagall undoubtedly knew every last detail of how you went about turning into a cat, but she seemed to have literally never heard of the scientific method. To her, it was just muggle magic, and she didn't even seem curious about what secrets might be hiding behind the natural language understanding of the retrieval charm. That left two possibilities, really. Possibility one. Magic was so incredibly opaque, convoluted, and impenetrable that even the wizards and witches had tried their best to understand, they'd made little or no progress and eventually given up, and Harry would do no better. Or... Possibility 2. He'd be taking over the world. Eventually. Perhaps not right away. Harry was examining the wizarding equivalent of a first aid kit, the Emergency Healing Pack Plus. A definite buy at five galleons, wouldn't you agree? And just why do you expect to need a healer's kit, young man? I don't expect to need it. It's just in case. Just in case of what? You think I'm planning to do something dangerous and that's why I want a medical kit? Just what sort of plan do you think I have going here? I don't know. But it ends either in you delivering a ton of silver to Gringotts or in world domination. World domination is such an ugly phrase. I prefer to call it world optimization. This failed to reassure Professor McGonagall, who was still giving him the look of doom. You really think that? You really think I'm planning to do something dangerous? Like that's the only reason anyone would ever buy a first aid kit? I am being prudent. I am being cautious. I am preparing for unforeseen contingencies. What I don't understand is why an 11-year-old boy is thinking about such things. Muggle researchers have found that people are always very optimistic. Like they say something will take two days and it takes ten. Or they say it'll be two months, and it takes over 35 years. If you ask someone what they expect in the normal case, they visualize what looks like the line of maximum probability at each step along the way. Namely, everything going according to plan, without any mistakes or surprises. It's called the planning fallacy, and the best way to fix it is to ask how long things took the last time you tried them. But when you're doing something new and can't do that, you just have to be really, really, really pessimistic. Like, so pessimistic that reality actually comes out better than you expected, about as often and as much as it comes out worse. It's actually really hard to be so pessimistic that you stand a decent chance of undershooting real life. Did anything happen to you personally that would scare you? What happened to me personally is only anecdotal evidence. It doesn't carry the same weight as a replicated, peer-reviewed journal article about a controlled study with random assignment, many subjects, large effect sizes, and strong statistical significance. I would still like to hear about it. There had been some muggings in our neighborhood, and my mother asked me to return a pan she'd borrowed to a neighbor two blocks down. And I said I didn't want to because I might get mugged. And she said, Harry, don't say things like that! Like thinking about it would make it happen. I tried to explain it to her, and she made me carry over the pan anyway. I was too young to know how statistically unlikely it was for a mugger to target me, but I was old enough to know that not thinking about something doesn't stop it from happening, so I was really scared. Nothing else? There isn't anything else that happened to you. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it was just one of those critical life moments, you know? Harry, sometimes you just don't seem 11 years old, or even at all human. And how do you explain your observations, Professor McGonagall? I don't know. But it's possible that something could have happened to you that you don't remember. Suppressed memory is a load of pseudoscience. 
People do not repress traumatic memories. They remember them all too well for the rest of their lives. No, Mr. Potter. There is a charm called obliviation. A spell that erases memories? But my parents couldn't do that. No, it would have taken someone from the wizarding world. Would you mind if I offered an alternative explanation? I'm too smart, McGonagall. Normal children simply aren't in my league. Adults don't respect me enough to really talk to me. And frankly, even if they did, they wouldn't sound as smart as Richard Feynman, so I might as well just read something Richard Feynman wrote instead. I'm isolated, Professor McGonagall, and I'm too intelligent to look up to my parents the way children are designed to. Sometimes I feel like they're the children. Children who won't listen and have absolute authority over my whole existence. I mean, I knew that not thinking about something doesn't stop it from happening. I knew that. But I could see that Mom really thought that way. That's when I realized that everyone who was supposed to protect me was actually crazy, and they wouldn't listen to me no matter how much I begged them, and that I couldn't ever rely on them to get anything right. There was a long silence. Um, can we get the healer's kit now? And if I say no, it's too expensive and you won't need it, what happens? Exactly what you're thinking, Professor McGonagall. I conclude you're another crazy adult I can't talk to, and I start planning how to get my hands on a healer's kit anyway. I will not allow you to push me around. I understand. He kept the resentment out of his voice and didn't say any of the other things that came to mind. All right, young man. Let's get that healer's kit. Harry's jaw dropped in surprise. Harry and McGonagall were walking out of Ollivander's, and Harry was staring at his wand. He'd waved it and produced multicolored sparks, which really shouldn't have come as such a great shock after everything else he'd seen. But somehow... I can do magic. Me. As in, me personally. I am magical. I am a wizard. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother... Why, its brother gave you that scar. That could not possibly be coincidence. Well, okay, actually it could be coincidence. But base theorem 101, any reasonable hypothesis which said it was more likely than a thousand to one that he'd end up with the brother to the Dark Lord's wand was going to have an advantage. You are a full wizard now. Congratulations. It's strange. I ought to be thinking about everything I've seen of magic, and yet I find myself distracted by relative trivialities like the whole boy who lived thing. It's just... odd. To find out that you were part of this grand story, the quest to defeat the great and terrible Dark Lord, and it's already done. Like your Frodo Baggins, and you find out that your parents took you to Mount Doom and had you toss in the ring when you were one year old and you don't even remember it. It's almost enough to make me wish that there were some loose ends from the quest, just so I could say that I really, you know, participated somehow. For example, you mentioned that my parents were betrayed. Who betrayed them? Sirius Black. He's in Azkaban, wizarding prison. Or maybe the Dark Lord didn't really die that night. Not completely. His spirit lingers, whispering to people in nightmares that bleed over into the waking world, searching for a way back into the living lands he swore to destroy. And now, in accordance with the ancient prophecy, he and I are locked in a deadly duel where the winner shall lose and the loser shall win. McGonagall looked at Harry with a calm expression. A very, very calm expression. I'm joking, Professor McGonagall. A slow, sinking sensation began to dawn in the pit of Harry's stomach. Ah, oh, crap. He's not dead, is he? At least tell me there's not really a prophecy. Mr. Potter, you shouldn't go inventing things to worry about. Are you going to tell me the truth now, Professor McGonagall? These are dreadful and important matters. They are secret, Mr. Potter. It is a catastrophe that you, still a child, know even this much. You must not tell anyone, do you understand? Absolutely no one! Well then, Professor McGonagall. It sounds like I have something you want. You can, if you like, tell me the truth, the whole truth. And in return, I will keep your secrets. How dare you! You would blackmail me! I am giving you a chance to keep your precious secret. If you refuse, I will have every natural motive to make inquiries elsewhere. Not to spite you, but because I have to know. Get past your pointless anger at a child who you think ought to obey you, and you'll realize that any sane adult would do the same. Look at it from my perspective. How would you feel if it was you? This has been an exhausting day, Mr. Potter. Can we get your trunk and send you home? I will trust you not to speak upon this matter until I have had time to think. 
Keep in mind that there are only two other people in the whole world who know about this matter, and they are Headmaster Albus Dumbledore and Professor Severus Snape. So, new information. That was a peace offering. So now I've got to find some way to kill an immortal dark wizard. I really wish you had told me that before I started shopping. The trunk shop was more richly appointed than any other shop Harry had visited. Harry had asked his questions and had gravitated to a trunk of heavy-looking wood. Not polished, but warm and solid. And, this was the important part, a handle on the bottom which slid out a frame containing a staircase leading down into a small lighted room that would hold, Harry estimated, around twelve bookcases. If they made luggages like this, Harry didn't know why anyone bothered owning a house. One hundred and eight gold galleons. That was the price of a good trunk, lightly used. Ninety-seven galleons. That was how much was left in the bag of gold Harry had been allowed to take out of Gringotts. I'm sorry, young man. This is entirely my fault. I would offer to take you back to Gringotts, but the bank will be closed for all but emergency services now. Let me guess. You thought you were leaving yourself plenty of error margin. I anticipated this, Professor McGonagall. There are research studies showing that this is what happens when people think they're leaving themselves plenty of error margin. If it were me, I'd have taken 200 galleons just to be sure. There was plenty of money in that vault, and I could have put back any extra later. But I knew you wouldn't let me do it. I knew there wasn't even any point in asking. I knew you would be annoyed and maybe even angry if I asked. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Her voice held a note of apology, and yet still a note of self-pride alongside that, as though Harry ought to notice how very, very honored he was to have Professor McGonagall apologizing to him. Well, Professor McGonagall, if you had to do it all over again, and I suggested taking out an extra hundred galleons just to be sure, would you listen to me that time? I take your point. You don't need to lecture me, young man. Ah, but I haven't gotten to my point. Do you know the difference between someone worth talking to and a mere obstacle, Professor McGonagall? From my perspective, that is? If an adult thinks that being superior than me, getting obedience from me, is the most important thing to them, then they will be an obstacle. A potential collaborator is someone who thinks that getting the job done is more important than making sure I know my place. Eleven loose galleons, please. And there was gold in Harry's hand. Where did you get that? From my vault, Professor McGonagall, when I fell into that pile of gold. So now the question is, are you angry at me for defying your authority, or glad that now our day ends in success instead of failure? Minerva? The salesman actually gasped out loud. Discipline at Hogwarts must be enforced. And that must include courtesy and obedience from you to all professors. I understand. Professor McGonagall. Then, I congratulate you on your preparedness. This woman might well be the sanest adult Harry had ever met, despite her lack of scientific background. Minerva McGonagall, plus one point. And they stood again in the courtyard of the Leaky Cauldron. Harry was to go to a payphone and call his father once he was on the other side. I was very impressed with you today. I should have remembered to compliment you out loud. I was awarding you points in my head and everything. Thank you, Mr. Potter. If you had already been sorted into a house, I would have deducted so many points that their grandchildren would still be losing the house cup. And, Mr. Potter, about your wand... I know what you're going to ask. Take it. I hadn't planned to do anything, not a single thing, but I don't want you to have nightmares about me blowing up my house. Oh no, Mr. Potter, that isn't done. I only meant to warn you not to use your wand at home, since the Ministry can detect underage magic and it is prohibited without supervision. Ah, that sounds like a very sensible rule. You really mean that? Yes, I get it. Magic is dangerous and the rules are there for good reasons. Goodbye for now. Harry turned to go, into the leaky cauldron and out toward the muggle world. Hermione Granger. Look for a first year girl named Hermione Granger on the train to Hogwarts. Who is she? There was no answer, and when Harry turned around, McGonagall was gone.